Got people sitting in the back that are honking criticism for those out, those out in the front. Mm. You're gonna honk it all. Honk some encouragement Amen. for those that are out in the leadership. Amen. Listen, volume five says ten members. How many? Ten. How many we got here at New Smyrna? Twelve. More than ten. <laughs> Ten members who were walking in all humbleness of mind would have a far greater power upon the world that has the entire church with its present numbers and lack of unity. Wow. Ten members united would have more power in the world than the entire church that's not united. So, number one, five reasons for unity. Number one to, is for strength and victory. Let me move to number two if you're taking notes. The second reason for unity is to answer the prayer of Jesus. Let's go back to our scripture reading for today from John 17. And I want to read again John 17, verse 11. John 17, verse 11. This is from the final prayer of Jesus before his passion. Here in prayer to his Father, he says, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be what? One. One. As we are. Notice the degree of unity that Christ wants us to reach. The same unity that exists between Christ and His Father is the degree of unity He wants to exist in the church. Amen. Go down to verse 21. Verse 21, that they all may be one as Thou, Father, art in me and I in Thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. So the second reason for unity is to answer the prayer of Jesus. We usually think about Christ answering our prayers. Here is the prayer, prayer he prayed that we are to answer. Tell me, when the disciples gathered together for the Last Supper, were they in harmony? Were they united? Did they have brotherly love for one another in their hearts? No, the Bible tells us in Luke 22, 24 to 27, there was a strife among them as to which should be the greatest. So Jesus, he's praying that they may be one. As we work for unity, we are answering the prayer of Christ. Here is the prayer we are to answer. So number two, to answer the prayer of Jesus. And then number three, verse 21, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So the third reason for unity, number three, that the world may believe in Jesus. Number three, that the world may believe in Jesus. Listen, this is from volume eight of Testimonies. Harmony and union existing among men of varied dispositions. What does that mean, varied dispositions? <clears throat> different personalities. Different people, different personalities. Is it hard to unite with somebody that thinks like you, that's like you, that has the same interests you have? Is that hard? No. No. Is it hard to unite with somebody that's so different from you it's like night and day? Yes. Uh, do we have that in the church? Yes. Yeah. So here it says, harmony and union existing among men of varied dispositions is the what? Strongest, Strongest witness. That can be born that God has <laughs> sent His Son into the world to save sinners. What's the strongest witness we can bear? Harmony and union, Harmony and union among people that are different. Amen. And that God wants us to experience here. John 13, verses 34 and 35. Turn there. You're in John already. Go back to John 13. And let's read verses 34 and 35. This is the new commandment. Not so much that it was new, but it was new for the disciples. It was new to them. John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you what? Love one another. Love one another. Think the Lord needs to tell us that today? Amen. 
that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If what? You if you keep another. the right day holy. I'm not saying that's not important. But that's not what Jesus says here. What's he say? If what? If ye have love one to another. When I was a boy, I remember my parents went one year to a African-American camp meeting. Remember the days of the camp meetings? Well, back when I grew up, I grew up in the Seventh-day Adventist home, we had camp meeting every summer. And this particular year, my parents decided to go to an African-American camp meeting. And I remember to this day the theme song for that camp meeting. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the blood. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. So you know the song. I never forgot that. Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, this volume 9 says unity is existing among the followers of Christ, is in evidence that the Father has sent His Son to save sinners. It is a witness to His power, for nothing short of the miraculous power of God can bring human beings with their different temperaments together in harmonious action their one aim being to speak the truth in love. What would it take for us to be united? Have one aim. Nothing short of a miraculous power of God can unite us together. Can that power be present here in New Smyrna? Amen. Oh yes. God wants it to be. The oneness, this is a different reference. Volume 1 says, the oneness and unity of God's truth-believing remnant. Revelation 12, 17. People carries powerful conviction to the world that they have the truth and are the peculiar chosen people of God. What will convict the world? Unity, unity existing here at New Smyrna Beach mm -hmm. among the members. Now tell me, where should this kind of unity begin? Prayer. It needs to begin in the home. Worship. Amen. If I can't get along with my wife, am I going to get along with the other brothers and sisters in the church? No. <laughs> I first need to get along with my, the members in my family. If you have unity in your family, then you're going to be, it's going to be easy for us to unite together as a church family. When we're fighting at home, well, we often bring those conflicts into church. So pray that God help you to be united in the home. Adventist Home says this, One, well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. I preach a lot of sermons over 30-some years of ministry. But one well-ordered, well-disciplined family will tell more in behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Adventist Home says the first work of Christians is to be united where? In the family. In the family. So pray for that in your family. Tell me, what was it that finally united the disciples together in one family? It was their love for Christ. Amen. It's sort of like the spokes of a wheel. The closer those spokes get to the center, the closer they get to each other, right? Yeah. So the closer the disciples got to Christ, except for Judas, the closer they got to one another, it was love for Christ that united them. So number three, third reason for unity is that the world may believe in Jesus. Let me move to number four now. If you're taking notes, the fourth reason for unity, that we may receive the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. Turn there in your Bible. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4. 
here in John. Just go to the next book. Acts 2, and we're going to read verses 1 to 4. The Bible says, And when they, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, that's Christ's followers, the disciples, and the other followers, they were all with one accord in one place. What does that sound like? Unity. Unity. This is accord, not discord. Accord. What was the result? And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with what? With the Holy Ghost began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Those were the other languages of the world so they could carry the gospel of the whole world. So the third, fourth reason for unity is that we may receive the Holy Spirit. Acts of the Apostle says the disciples prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet men in their daily intercourse to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. Putting away all differences. Amen. Hmm. All desire for the supremacy. What did they do? They came close together in Christian fellowship. What was the result? Unity. The Holy Spirit was poured out. The fourth reason for unity is that we may receive the Holy Spirit. Tell me, is God going to pour out His Spirit upon a church that's fighting itself? No. Never. Never. We have to work for unity, be in unity in order to receive the Holy Spirit. And then my final reason for unity, number five, if you're taking notes, that we may be used of God to win souls. You want to be a soul winner? Yes. Then you must be in harmony with your brothers and sisters. Let me read a text from 2 Corinthians 12, 20. These are the words of Paul, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 20. And as we read this, I want you to ask yourself if you would want to be a part of a church like this. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 20 says, <clears throat> Paul says, For I fear, lest <clears throat> when I shall come, I shall not find you such as I would. And that I shall be found unto you such as you would not. Lest there be debates, envies, wraths, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. If you were looking for a church, would you want to be a part of a church like that? A church where they have... Debates and envyings and wraths and stripes, strifes and backbitings and whispering and tumult. Would you want to join that church? No. I hear you say no. Well, we certainly don't want that to be happening here. That's why we need to strive for unity, that we may be used of God to win souls. Let's review those five reasons for unity. Number one was? For strength and victory. Number two? To answer the prayer of Jesus. Number three. That the world may believe, that the world may believe in Jesus. Number four. That we, may be filled that we may receive the Holy Spirit. And number five. That we may be used of God to win souls. Now you might be wondering, what does all this have to do with public evangelism? Let me read the answer. The present truth, believed in the heart, and exemplified in the life, makes God's people one, and gives them a powerful influence. Would you like to have a powerful influence to move the community? Yes. Then we need to be united. Here's another reference, volume 6. The success of the meeting, this is an evangelistic meeting, the success of the meeting depends on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. For the outpouring of the Spirit, every lover of the cause of truth should pray. And as far as lies in our power, we are to what? Remove, Remove every hindrance to His working. The Spirit can never be poured out, while variance and bitterness toward one another are cherished by the members of the church. Amen. Envy. 
jealousy, evil surmising. You know what evil surmising is? That's when I'm surmising, I'm thinking evil of somebody that might not be true. <laughs> Uncle Bob didn't even say, didn't even greet me this morning in church. He must be mad at me. I wonder what I said. I'm, see, I'm thinking he's evil about Uncle Bob. It may be nothing to do with me or Uncle Bob. Maybe Uncle Bob didn't hear me as he greeted him. Or maybe he was thinking of something else when I passed him. And I'm evil surmising. Envy, jealousy, evil surmising, evil speaking are of who? Satan. Are of Satan and they effectually bar the way against the Holy Spirit's working. Do you see our problem? Yeah. The success of the meeting, the evangelistic meeting, we're going to start on Friday, <laughs> it depends on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. But then it says, envy, jealousy, evil surmising, and evil speaking are of Satan. And what do they do? They bar the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church. So essentially that's barring success in evangelism. Do you see we have a work to do? If there's bitterness among us, the envy among us, if there's some church member you don't like, we have some homework to do before next Friday. You know, bitterness is not, not only bad for the church, it's bad for you. Bad for your health. Let me read to you from the doctor. This is CNN News. Studies have shown that bitter, angry people have higher blood pressure, and heart rate, and are more likely to die of heart disease and other illnesses. So if you're cherishing bitterness towards somebody in the church, it's not even good for you. You're increasing your risk of, of heart disease. The data that negative mental, mental states cause heart problems is just stupendous. The data is just as established as smoking, and the size of the effect is the same. So I don't smoke, well praise the Lord, but you have bitterness. If you're cherishing bitterness towards somebody in the church, that's just as if you were, it's going to have the same effect on your health as if you were smoking. So it's not just something we need as a church to prepare for evangelism. It's something we need in our own experience for better health. The success of the meeting depends on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Envy, jealousy, evil surmising, evil speaking are of Satan. And they effectually bar the way against the Holy Spirit's working. Now the question of course is how? How can we be united? Let me give you two suggestions. First of all, pray together. Amen. It's hard to criticize that lady that you're regularly praying with. Amen. You're not going to be gossiping about her, backbiting her, if you every week you have a prayer appointment when you get together and pray with that sister. Prayer will remove that disunity between the two of you. I remember years ago I was the administrator of a Christian campus and we had a great program going and it wasn't because I was a good administrator but because I would meet with my department heads once a week for prayer. We would pray together about the issues in that department there on the campus. And prayer united us together as an administrative team so we were able to deal with all sorts of things. Prayer bonds us together. And then the second suggestion I want to make to you is to surrender self. That is the hard part. Self is what creates division among us. That's why the disciples, what did they do? They put away all differences, all desire for the supremacy. They came close together. The success of the meeting. We're going to start Friday depends on the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. For the outpouring of the Spirit, every lover of the cause of truth should pray. And as far as lies in our power, we should what? Remove every hindrance to His working. We're going to begin.
this Friday. What should you do? All right, here's my suggestions. Number one, pray. Pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out here in this church and on this community. Pray for revival in your own heart and here in the church, among us as church members. And then pray for unity. You know that there is an issue. I don't know. I mean, I'm a guest here. Um, my experience, though, in traveling around doing meetings in so many churches is that this is a problem that's almost universal. Very few churches don't have a problem with disunity in the church. So this is something we need to address as we prepare for evangelism starting Friday. That's number one, prayer. Number two, invite someone to the prophecy meetings. We have the little cards. Use those cards to invite someone. Would you like to say with me, Lord, unite us together as a church. Mm -hmm. As we start doing evangelism, I see this so often. We start out, we're excited. And then after a few days, I begin hearing things like criticism. She's not doing that right. He's not doing that right. There's a problem here. We start criticizing one another. And I recognize immediately that the devil is at work to create division in the local church. Because he knows that he can divide us. He's won the battle. Mm -hmm. What we need is we begin the conflict. Because when we go to carry the gospel of the community, we're, we're declaring war on the devil. As we begin the warfare, we need to begin united together. How many want to pray that God help you to be united with the team here? Now, before we, or before the day is over, if there is someone here in the church you know that you're, you have an issue with, don't let this day pass without addressing that issue. You need to go to somebody before fellowship lunch to say, you know, I've been cherishing bitterness towards you for what you said or what you did or whatever. Do that today so that we can be united together. We're going to end our worship by singing the song, Onward Christian Soldiers. This is a great song for evangelism because we are invading enemy territory. So let's sing this as our theme song as we launch into evangelism this coming week. I'll invite you to stand with me as we sing. This is hymn number 612 in the hymnal, or you can follow along on the screen.
invite you to join us in the afternoon after our fellowship lunch. We have some uh, instructions for our helpers, and we would like you to help us. We invite you to help us. So after our lunch, we would invite you to stay with us for the afternoon program. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the call to our hearts to unite in the work of evangelism. We pray that this miracle of divine grace would happen here in this church. We might be a united church carrying the gospel to our community. Bless each church member here that our hearts might have that heaven born love for one another. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.